But let me start with a, a story, a real story. As a minister, a former minister of education, I am a former minister of education, but as a minister of education a decade ago, naturally I attended many uh, meetings, conferences, reunions, uh, and uh, in uh, some of them, other ministers of education were participating. Nuno Crato, who is also a former minister of education, and Adrian Courage, a former minister of education, and also Madeleine, who is not a former minister of education, it's a future minister of education, but she worked uh, from uh, European Training Foundation with many ministers of education in Europe and uh, outside Europe will recognize immediately the kind of discussion that uh, I will uh, share with you in the next uh, minutes. At one moment, I was sitting in a reunion with other 20, 30 ministers, and someone was telling us uh, the fact that the objective, the purpose of education is to serve the market, labor market. And uh, at this first meeting, I didn't say anything. It was, I think, in my first month as a Minister of Education. But two weeks later, in another meeting, also with other Ministers of Education, but uh, in a different format, I heard exactly the same statement. The objective of education in our systems is to serve the labor market. And as a graduate of teacher training, immediately asked the floor and I said, you know, maybe something is wrong. I was taught or during my uh, student uh, period, uh, education is something more. It's about uh, personal development. It's about uh, citizenship and our responsibility as citizens. And it's about labor market. So I don't think we have to cut the two other pillars, for example, responsibility towards society and to focus just on one pillar related to uh, labor market. And practically, somehow, this is a discussion of today uh, conference, education and human security, because education is sure for many things that we have many objectives, but in fact, we have to serve our societies, and I put the, the S for plural, because it's not just an issue related to the way we live in Portugal or in Romania or in an African country, the way we live, that will have an impact on uh, everyone. And the responsibility of education to approach these topics, that means in an international context, that means international education among others, and also we have to count, and I'll conclude here, uh, my first intervention, we have to count on the value of multilateralism. There are topics which are very important to be, it's useful to be discussed in a bilateral way, but there are topics that we have to discuss in a larger context. And for this point of view, the fact that we had in the opening of our uh, conference, two former general directors of UNESCO, Federico Mayer and Irina Bokova, also, I think it's a proof of the value of um, multilateralism, of the multilateral dialogue when we speak about everything, including about education and human security. As I mentioned, I invited uh, uh, in this panel uh, friends with a lot of experience in the education, research, uh, sector in the national and uh, European global context. But I would like, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, to ask uh, Madeleine Sherban, uh, who used to be for many years general director in the Romanian Ministry of Education, but uh, also she's played a very important role in the um, educational policies in Western Balkans, where she chaired for many years the Committee on Education. And also, she played a very important role in implementing in Romania European projects, not just on education. And uh, for um, a couple, I think two mandates, for eight years, she led the European Training Foundation, one of the very important uh, institutions of the European Commission to work on the topic of education 
uh, in a very multidisciplinary way, uh, but also inside Europe, but outside Europe. Madeleine, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that is really an honor for me. And I thank you very much uh, to you, uh, Minister Emus Picopi, and well, uh, future president of, uh, of the world. I thank you very much indeed, because you are the man that is always on the agenda. And um, I would like uh, to express my gratitude to the World Academy of Art and Sciences and to the World Con University Consortium for accepting me, of course, at your proposal to be part of this panel. Um, when you refer to the, to the purpose of uh, the higher education and of the education in general, you reminded me about another, I would say, um, very important person in our lives, uh, Mircea Malica, that um, used to be one of the first visionaries of what the world should be about in 72. Uh, he just illustrated how the world will look like in 2000, and I'll not say more, in front of the specialist in the foresight, that is Minister Adrian Kurash. He's the one that will discuss about the foresights and the futures and the visions. I'm very sure about that, hopefully so. But what I wanted to say, the reason I, uh, I just, it came to my mind, Mircea Malica was because um, he was the one that when referring to the purpose of education, he said, uh, what, what are you saying there, labor market? but we are not in the market. We are not selling vegetables. So we are discussing about human beings. So, and this was at the anniversary that you organized, Remus Pricopia. So on the occasion of his uh, 90 years anniversary, and uh, he was very kind to remind all of us that not to forget this uh, mandate that we are having all of us. And um, well, it's never, it's never too late to learn, he said, and therefore, we are also here to discuss <clears throat> what to learn, what is the purpose of higher education for making sure that we are serving the communities and we are serving the people. And in this panel, you also suggested to reflect upon the topic of what the higher education is capable to do for human security in terms of putting a focus, a better focus maybe, on laws, institutions and policies. And for my humble experience as a young woman as I am, um, but working in the Western Balkans and on a number of countries, I have to say that when referring to policies, um, I, I will say from my experience, as I said, that uh, first of all, we have to ask ourselves why the policies did not pay off. Why we had, we continue to have all these issues that we continue to have on the planet. Why is not yet there the equity? What is not yet there the poverty alleviation? Why is not there the human rights and the fundamental freedoms? Why in the human-centered security, we are still speaking about these inequalities? And unfortunately, we are not capable and in our geographical neighborhood, we have to look at, we are not yet able to cut off these armed conflicts. So what is wrong with us, guys? So then this is my question. And I'm not capable to answer immediately, but I'm capable to share with you my thoughts. And I think that most probably, even if we are speaking about global issues, we are still treating them in a patching way not at a system-wide manner. And when speaking about system, I'm referring to engaging citizens, but engaging the citizens, not for ticking the box, not for populistic reasons, but empower them to play a real role in the policy formulation, in the policy implementation, because too many times in the different countries, including ours, to be very honest. We consider the policy as being done when a paper or a law is adopted. But when action should follow, I'm afraid that we don't look at the implementation in a systemic manner. And then there is another issue, is the issue of the context that matters. I will just refer 
to again my experience to the Arab Spring follow up. We were considering that democracy is the way to go for each of the countries involved. Unfortunately, it was not the case. And therefore, when looking to the policies and having them empowered to enter into the dialogue, we have to make sure that we know which are the values that count for the people in the respective community, in the respective society, and to make sure that we are capable to listen and to put in place those policy measures that make a difference for them and not for us, for the so-called consultants, because we know that in the policy typology we have as well this approach of the consultancy-based policy advises. So then let's advise and empower people to make sure that we are solving their problems and we don't go there with our solutions that don't fit to each other. So if we will move away from this, um, um, I would say donor driven uh, approaches and we'll make sure that we are creating the islands of normality, of course that we have to make sure as well the next steps will be will go for the scaling up because we risk to have still a patching approach if we are going to have islands of normality that are driven by the donors. And then if we are capable to create a frame for action and to put the policy in this logic, most probably the people will feel the owners of the policies. Otherwise, the, if the co-creation is not there, it will be always an external opinion, an external perception. And that's why I think in my humble view that again, in addition to empowerment, the type of governance that we put in place, it's essential for all these policies. It should be multi-level, should go at the grassroots level, and it should be like I'm continuously saying is my credo, it should be a governance that it's agile, it's entrepreneurial in the terms of takes risks and it is anticipatory because we can't simply solve the problem of yesterday all the time. We should be capable to anticipate in the way that we can to explore the future. And I'm stopping here, as I said, because uh, we, we know who's going to, I know who knows to answer these questions here with us in, in the panel. And that's why my, my last word here is take advantage of the multilateralism. Because in the policy making, we have the policy metrics. And in UNESCO, we have the university twinnings, the network of universities. We have the UNESCO chairs, and I'm extremely grateful to have here not only a person that knows, but a person that and persons that are already capable to share the knowledge of how should look like the future of our higher education, and not only, but science included as well. So let's take advantage of the networks. Let's make sure that we give the possibility to the events of the year of 2023, when we are revising the recommendation on education for peace, international cooperation, and sustainable development, then human security is in and is not coming like a hobby, like a hobby of someone, but is taken seriously by all the actors that are involved. And I'm counting very much on that. I'm ready to cooperate with all the national commissions for UNESCO that are ready to stay active in that. And I'm sure that as we are speaking, all the chairs that are the UNESCO chairs that are involved in this topic will again are ready to go hand in hand for making sure that at the end of the day we will have something to report. My last word is about accountability. Unless we are not becoming accountable for what we have, what we have to do, I'm afraid nothing will move. So that's why. Um, I'm going for citizens engagement, an agile, entrepreneurial and anticipatory governance, multi-level, grassroots with a frame for action, and let's be accountable, each of us, for whatever we do. I was so impressed in the opening by the example that has been offered by the Green Hope Foundation. And I said to myself, if they can, then, all the higher education institution are capable too. So then let's 
shake hands and let's go together. And I thank you for this first intervention very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madeleine. Uh, it's true, sometimes it's most it's better to identify the correct questions than to try to give uh, an individual answers. And you underline a couple of very sensitive uh, topics. For example, the one with uh, uh, public policies, which are very clear because we know what's the situation. We have research, not just in uh, our countries, but uh, transversal research. The issue of access and equity, we know exactly technically how to approach this, what's the situation, but unfortunately, access and equity, is still a topic in 2023, even though 2015 was considered a couple of decades ago, the year when we have to address this. And we have not. And now we postpone for uh, another year, 2030 and so on. So why all of this happens? I don't have uh, a clear answer. Uh, what I know, and I just realized now in, uh, the, um, uh, in our discussion and looking to the screen, Nuno Crato was a technocrat minister, <laughs> not a classical politician. Adrian Courage was a technocrat minister. I was a technocrat minister. I have nothing against political ministers. But there are a huge difference in, uh, in the behavior of a specialist and the behavior of a politician. A politician has to deliver tomorrow because during the weekend they have elections. Technocrats have the luxury to look to some topics beyond the mandate because they don't do something that just to, you know, to, to make up the situation and to get the votes from the citizens. They are trying to approach in a way that will be um, um, sustainable. And public policies generally, especially in education and also in human security, if we go further, are public policies which have to be implemented and followed and assessed in more than four or five years. So probably this is a topic, probably we don't have the instruments to control how we can correctly implement policies beyond the four years mandate of some uh, politicians. Again, it's just an opinion. I'm not uh, saying I, am, I have the uh, I am right, but uh, maybe we have to look at this and also connect with the idea of accountability. And let me tell, give you another example. In Romania, we have more or less 200,000 kids on a cohort. And when we speak about access and equity, our first approach in an international context is the following. We don't really have a problem. So comparing with other countries, very poor countries, Romania, it's very good. We have a uh, rate of um, um, dropout of 0 0.5 percentage for primary, very small. But when you have 200,000 kids, that means each year, kids between six, six to 10, 10,000 kids between six to 10 years old are out of the school. They are in a risky situation and the concept of human security doesn't apply any longer for them because we are not capable to keep them in school, 0 0.5. This is a kind of approach which Romania has to have today. And uh, even though we, uh, we, we have a good position in statistics if we speak uh, globally, but uh, I'm sure, uh, Nuno, uh, no, no, sorry, I asked Adrian Courage to be the second one. I'm sure Adrian has also a lot of uh, things to share with us from his experience, not just as a minister of education or uh, advisor of the prime minister or different other positions that he has had, but uh, as an um, educator for uh, 40 years. 
Adrian. Much, uh, Remus. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm so pleased to be together with you. Uh, I missed a few of uh, meetings, uh, but now I am here. And uh, coming to the coming to the session, uh, I uh, ask uh, I ask a question: Who is carries the responsibility for human security? And if you allow me, I will go step by step for, uh, let's say, at the end of the story to reach the the, the very core of our session. Um, and of course, uh, the overall responsibility for human security is shared among a range of actors and uh, requires collaboration and partnership across sectors and the levels of, of governance. But working together, we can promote uh, a more just, peaceful, and secure world where individuals and communities are protected, empowered, and able to thrive. Fine. Uh, if we look a little bit, then we start with government. Uh, government is the, the first on my, uh, on my level. And, you know, in a way, it's linked with um, what Madeleine said and what you said, Remus. Uh, um, government has have uh, governments have the primary responsibility to protect uh, their citizens and ensure their safety and well-being. I'll not go into details here. International organizations, uh, as United Nations, but not only United Nations and their agencies, including the uh, World Academy of Art and Science, in our case. Uh, uh, have a responsibility to promote human security by providing different kind of assistance. Later on, the next stage is about uh, civil society organizations, um, uh, NGOs and community-based organizations uh, and grassroots organizations also playing a critical role in promoting human security. And last but not least, uh, least uh, individuals also have a responsibility to promote human security by respecting the rights and dignity of others, participating in democratic processes and advocating for policies and practices that promote human security. Now, the second question uh, uh, immediately coming after this was ki what kind of capabilities the government uh, needs and uh, what kind of skills and competencies individuals need for uh, being uh, actors uh, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, subject. Um, and uh, I will start saying uh, something about government. And uh, already Madeleine said something about uh, the need of uh, the anticipatory capability in the governments. And uh, anticipatory innovation governance, not from the point of view of uh, technology, and uh, because anticipatory innovation governance uh, is coming from years uh, from the technology, but from the point of view of uh, Observatory of Public Sector Innovation, uh, OECD, uh, where the future literacy uh, people behind the organization are uh, so important uh, uh, because uh, anticipatory innovation is the ability of organization to consistently perceive, understand, and act on the future as it emerges in the present. From my point of view, it's about being prepared. Being prepared meaning uh, understanding uh, trends, and there are a lot of trends affecting the, the, the human security, but also weak signals. Uh, it's about uh, co-creation and citizen participation in approaching different subjects. It's about uh, black swan and uh, having scenario for uh, avoiding uh, 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 critical moments and being prepared for different options. Uh, and the uh, scenarios for uh, understanding again the, the, the options for the future, but also helping to act today uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in being uh, um, capable to understand and, uh, and uh, move uh, forward. Uh, if, we, uh, if I move uh, next, uh, it's about people. And it's about uh, skills and competencies people need to take an active role as citizens. Uh, and why not to play a significant role when we talk about human security, understanding and, uh, and discussing and acting on the subject. Uh, but here I have a subsequent uh, questions. Uh, and my question is, uh, at what educational level, uh, when, to start uh, preparing, educating for uh, human security? 
and uh, it's important because um, again uh, um, if you allow me to to say something uh, to come from the end to the beginning it is a long life learning uh, process uh, in uh, understanding and being uh, active around such a dynamic uh, subject. But definitely we have to start uh, at very early childhood education level. And in a way it's also linked with multiculturalism here. And uh, at that level, uh, children have to be thought about basic needs, uh, such food, water, shelter, healthcare, and how these needs are essential for their well-being and security. I'll not go into details, but here also we need transversal skills, empathy, cooperation, conflict resolution, um, uh, which are actually essential skills for promoting human security. If we move forward uh, uh, at the primary and secondary educational level, also students can learn about human rights and citizenship and democratic values and how this concept related to the human security. And it's so important not to miss people during the process and uh, those uh, the the drop rate at the very early stage actually put an uh, an uh, unpleasant stamp on the future of citizenship uh, uh, of uh, of our uh, of our uh, uh, people and uh, at the higher education level students can can deepen their understanding of human security issues to develop specialized skills and knowledge related to areas such as conflict resolution, humanitarian assistance, environmental sustainability, and social justice. And, 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 I, I, I am so pleased to add something, future literacy. Future literacy, because if you look at the skills you need uh, in, um, in preparing your students, uh, now I'm coming to higher education, in preparing your students, uh, it is not uh, usual to see future literacy here, but uh, future literacy is an important aspect of human security as it involves the ability to anticipate and navigate future challenges and opportunities. Uh, overall future literacy is essential component of promoting human security as it allows us to anticipate and navigate again futures challenges and opportunities. By fostering future literacy, we can build more resilience and secure worlds that promotes well-being and prosperity for all individuals and community. And last but not least, a part of these uh, skills and competencies, when we talk about uh, preparing uh, and investing in our, uh, in our uh, students, uh, it's also about the, the nice, beautiful universe of uh, knowledges of political sciences. Uh, we have to understand to have knowledge and our students transversal knowledge on, uh, on uh, uh, sociology because uh, they could understand uh, the social dynamics and contribute to insecurity and so on and so on and so on. So there are different kinds of uh, skills and competencies. I want to focus, I wanted to focus here on anticipatory in, uh, uh, and the future literacy skills skills, from my personal point of view, and also coming from the experience I have, are very important to deal with uh, the complex world we are living in. Thank you. Adrian, I listen to you very carefully, and I understand you are proposing uh, a kind of um, general curriculum but uh, let's consider I am a politician in a country where the, my vision as a politician would be my country first. And I will answer you back saying we'll teach our kids the way we want. So how do you answer to such uh, politicians? Because uh, yes, I agree. There are some topics and UNESCO here has played a very important role on some not sensitive uh, topics to try to guide different countries how to build their national curriculum. There is a specialized institute of UNESCO in Geneva focused on uh, curriculum. I'm sure you have uh, worked with them. Uh, but you know, th these solutions, in fact, is a question of Madeleine uh, in her intervention. We have the solution, but they are accepted, but not necessarily correctly implemented, or you have the situation where they just, they are not accepted. So how you uh, persuade people 
to do what you said. It's a question for me, yes, sorry. Yeah, um, because I wanted yeah, yeah. to Okay, fine. You. It's not about frustrating uh, to do what I said. It's about uh, uh, knowledge we have uh, as professional, but also uh, skills we need as uh, citizens. So it's something transversal. And also in every area we are working uh, in uh, and we develop our uh, competencies and skills, uh, I think um, understanding the challenges, the systemic view and understanding the challenges is uh, something uh, cross-cutting uh, our uh, existence. Uh, so uh, it's not about imposing, it's about the need uh, uh, to be prepared uh, in your profession to understand what is happening around uh, um, uh, for understanding what is happening in the society and contribute uh, as citizen for the citizen dialogue uh, in uh, at the whole levels of uh, society. Um, Co-creation process, uh, in a way, it's uh, part of the uh, future uh, 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 literacy, if you allow me. And uh, it's just being uh, an uh, active citizen, a part of being a professional in, some, in a certain area. Thank you very much, Adrian. As usually, a very optimistic person. No, no. What do you think? Uh, I'm a very pessimistic person. So, <laughs> no, so I'm balance just balance with Adrian. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Ramos, for inviting me. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, my uh, panel um, friends, to be here as well for this discussion. I'm going to take a, a slightly different point of view. Um, I'm going to consider the education and the basics of education as um, a source, a possible source of, of inequality and unrest and um, problems in the world. Well, first of all, nothing is stands by itself. What I mean is this. You can look, if you look at the beginning of the 21st century or the, in 1925, around that, that period, we look at the most advanced country in the world culturally, and that's Germany. And Germany started a war. So we can say that just because they are educated, they will be um, pacifists and they will be solidarity with the rest of the world. And uh, that's what happened there, unfortunately, and uh, as everybody knows. So as everybody knows, education is not synonym with being nice to other people. It's not a synonym with being solidarity with other people. It's, it's, not, it's not a synonym of being uh, civil just in, in in a world in a word so but we should that that means that we should take care of education and we shouldn't think that from education everything derives automatically it's not true we should we should help people to understand other cultures so erasmus for instance i think it's one of the main um of the most important things that is happening in Europe because it's it brings youth from all around Europe to understand other people, understand other cultures, understand things that they had no idea that were possible, understand their difficulties, understand that when they go to their countries, they will have the same difficulties. And so this is really something very promising, Erasmus, and other things that are, that are being done. But we should discuss in schools lots of things that in a very active way. So what happened with dictatorships? What, what happens in countries that are suffering? What happens with countries that are suffering because of um, basic basic needs that are not satisfied as it happened, unfortunately, with so many countries in, in Africa and so on. So all this is something that has to be done. But if we fail the basic education, uh, it's very difficult to succeed with the other the other parts because if our kids will not be ready to fulfill a, a dignifying future to have a profession to be active in society to be able to participate in society by reading newspapers by understanding problems by discussing things by being literate and if they don't have a quantitative logic in their minds because they failed basic math, if this happens, then we are in trouble. And unfortunately, that's what's happening now in Europe and in, in the world. Sorry, let me start with the world. So if we go to the world, we know that from 
2017 uh, study of UNESCO, we have around 56, 58 people in the world, you, young people of 10 years, 10 years old, that can't essentially read and that can't essentially do basic computations. So we ask what is less, it's 10% of 100 or 15% of 100 of and 50, and they don't know to answer, or even simpler than that. So let's say more than half of kids in the proper age, they, they lack basic skills. And if we ask them to read something, to read uh, instructions, to read, um, to read the instructions for uh, a medicine, they fail, they can't read, they don't understand what they are reading because they don't have fluency in reading. This was in 2017. After the pandemic, I don't know if these studies have been published already, but I heard Stefania Giannini uh, from UNESCO saying that they, they were coming to estimates that were much more um, serious, that were about 75%. Of kids, I don't know. Uh, Madeleine is is nodding, so maybe you, you know the numbers better than I do. I don't. I don't know them published. So if any of you know them, where they are, if they are have been published, and if where they are, I would appreciate it very much. But we have an order of magnitude for this situation, and now we think we in Europe are fantastic. We we are the new Greeks and new Romans, and uh, we are everything. But if we look at st similar statistics. In, for instance, in PISA, for low performers in reading and low performers in mathematics, we have about 20%. So let's say one fifth of kids, 15 year olds now, 15 year olds have trouble with basic reading, have trouble with basic mathematics. And even worse than this is the fact that we are not progressing. On the opposite, this, the percentage of um, low performers in Europe is growing. It's growing one, 2%, something like that, half a percent per year if we do a, a, an average of the last 10 years or some, something like that. I don't want to, to give precise numbers because I don't recall them, but it's growing. So we are not improving in terms of reducing the difficulties that we have in these people. And we know that these students usually are those who come from less privileged backgrounds. So we are not giving the possibility to them. So we, and we are talking about one fifth of our youth. We are not giving them the possibility to improve. And I'm not saying this is going to start a war between countries or this is starting unrest or this is, this is going to start criminality, but this is grounds this is a foundation for trouble we are we are facing trouble and we should face this and so this is essentially my point of view is that we should everywhere all the time address the question of education quality our failures and how we are going to succeed to improve them now just to get to a point about the labor market and so on um i, I think that it's 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 really ridiculous to say that we want kids to serve the labor market because it's it's absolutely ridiculous. But but now let me let me take almost the opposite point of view. If they don't get employment, we are in trouble. <laughs> so we have to prepare our kids also for the labor market. And let me quote here a study that I found very interesting, though, because we all have this heard this discussion between knowledge and competencies and and uh, high end uh, culture and low end culture and so on. And sometimes we think, oh, to read um, to read newspapers, to read this, to read that, the basic things. We need basic skills. Well. We need basic skills, but the better we read, the better. And there is a very interesting study by John Jerim about what he calls and 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 a co-worker John Jerem is a is a education economist based in London uh, he worked with pisa data and he found a very interesting association the kids that learn more fiction are those that understand better technical instructions and other type of of literature so this is I think this is very, uh, for us who love knowledge and who love history and who love literature and so on, this is very reassuring because it, this is telling us we should teach kids the important things that our civilization has attained because if they read 
poems, if they read literature, they will be able then to act better in their professional, professional lives. Thank you. That is essentially what I wanted to say. Thank you, Ramos, again for, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Nono, and thank you all for accepting to have this discussion. Um, yes, we know what are the problems. We, we know what are the risks for uh, an uneducated kid or uneducated generations. As we mentioned, even though we know, unfortunately, we don't see the progress, Nuno, in fact, underlined it is correct. Somehow, we don't have the progress. We have the opposite of progress at uh, the level of um, uh, our societies. But I would like to go back to the role of some institutions and uh, to, 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 try to see how we can together work because uh, we have UNESCO, uh, Madeleine now is a uh, general secretary of the Romanian uh, UNESCO commission. Uh, we have OECD, but they produce excellent documents, but many of the reports or uh, documents uh, prepared by these institutions specialized on education, they are not read by uh, the, uh, politicians, the one who dis decide, or they are not understood. And here, I don't know if Gary is uh, with us, we had a lot of discussions about the way we, the educator, university, schools, train, prepare the future leaders. If you are a politician, a minister of education, a prime minister, and you don't understand the value of UNESCO, even the value of UNESCO, uh, to understand the value of UNESCO, at least, to be able to pay the annual contribution and to let UNESCO to do the work. If you don't understand the value of comparative approach, if you, are, if you don't understand why it's important Syrian kids to be educated, because you might say we don't care about Syrian kids, but we have young generation migrating here in Europe or in other places because they are not educated, they don't have uh, opportunities in their countries, we don't have to blame the one deciding to uh, migrate. We have to blame the lack of policies in the specific regions. But politicians have to uh, understand this way. I attended four or five weeks ago a meeting in Washington, D.C. Um, with the head of the uh, World Food Organization saying one dollar invested or one euro invested in sub-Saharian countries, it's equal with a couple of thousands of euro per month in an European country or United States. Because if you don't invest one dollar in the education, as Madeleine said about the donors, if you don't invest one dollar in some sub-Saharian countries, in one day, they will migrate in Europe and it will cost you a lot, including financially. All of these are calculated. But our politicians are not necessarily, again, I have nothing against politicians, but the criticism is good to make the politician to be better. So this is the purpose of our uh, intervention. So I totally agree with the um, uh, way we have to look at the education in a comparative way, in a, uh, from a comparative perspective, to support the role of international education uh, institutions to do their work, to picture the situation globally, to try and uh, happy get it uh, with us to uh, preach for a kind of um, model of preparing the leaders, the leadership classes, some leader, we say, okay, what is important for a leader, Econo economy, law, no, it's important also to understand the um, impact of lack of policies on uh, access and equity. Education generally, we know, as uh, former members of the government, is the last topic on the agenda. No, it should be the first. Because as Nuno said, we in fact build not solutions for the future, but the problems for the future just because we don't know to approach educational policy appropriately. 
Gary, if you'd like to contribute to our discussion, especially, and I think it's, it's a good moment to speak about uh, the initiative of the World Academy of Art and Science to try to look at the leadership programs globally. Someone not being able to understand the concept of human security will never serve or uh, implement policies associated with human security. Thank you, Ramos. Okay. Thank you, Ramos, and thanks all of the panelists for a very rich and diverse uh, set of views. Uh, Nuno, I was particularly intrigued by your comments about reading literature, because uh, it's my own experience uh, that we can provide, we get more, I've gotten more insight into life and social uh, change and processes through literature than I did through many of the academic uh, uh, studies. So I, it's very interesting. Uh, Ramos, I wanted to, you've raised too many questions for a short time, and I hope we'll raise, we'll, ad we'll address them in the rest of the conference. But I did want to comment on what you said about UNESCO, uh, because it's a very common thing today, whether in, I'm in the US now and I'm going back to India in a few days, uh, and wherever it goes, it raises the question, how much do our youth understand about the role of the multilateral institutions and how important they are? I mean, we simply would not have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. We would not have this universal preoccupation with human rights if it wasn't for the multilateral systems. We may have it in specific countries, but as a global norm, the SDGs put up in 2015 were really, Jeffrey Sachs said it well, it was the embodiment of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948, which everybody agreed to, everybody means about 60 countries only then were around, uh, but which nobody agreed to enforce, nobody uh, committed to realize. And now we have a global commitment of 193 countries. But how much is our education, our leaders in every field, uh, as Catan mentioned in his opening, uh, we were really surprised at the consumer electronics show of how readily and, um, and emphatically business leaders embraced the message of human security and said, yes, it is our responsibility. It is the world we live in and our future is going to depend on it. And that's the same thing, the message that we're trying to take to the finance industry. The, the future of economic development depends on managing threats and risks and creating a stable environment for the social development of the world. And unless we are investing in human security issues needs, we're simply not going to have the environment that's going to support. Even now we see how, how fragile even the peace is after th uh, how many decades of stability and peace and a sense of relative sense of security in the world. So I'm, I'm glad you raised this because it's the beginning of a much larger discussion. It's not only for specialists who are gonna be political leaders or business leaders or in finance, but what every citizen needs to understand about the important role of the SDGs, of the multilateral system, of international law. And I think we're at a very, I, I, I'm, it's somewhat depressing when I talk to very educated young generations in India and here who've never heard of the SDGs, who, and in America particularly, who don't understand the value of the multilateral institutions. How are we going to get it the buy-in we need, the support we need from the future generations to take up and build on what's been created and take it much further uh, if we don't if we don't do that through the educational system. So you have started a very important discussion on many fronts uh, which need to be uh, pursued. And I hope that we'll be exploring them much more uh, in the rest of this conference and also in the papers that we're looking for from, uh, from you and other speakers uh, to be published afterwards which will really, we try to send an agenda for how this topic has to be pursued in future in, in greater depth than, than we have the time to do today. So thank you all.
Thank you, Gary, for your intervention. Uh, I know Adrian is uh, in a hurry because he has to move to another session. But let me share with you uh, what we did in uh, Romania and together with the colleagues from other European countries on education and on the Bologna process. Bologna process is uh, a large discussion about higher education in, across Europe, outside the European Union, so including European Union, but also there are 46 countries. And at one moment we realized we need uh, 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 to, to increase the dynamic of discussion. And it was the idea of Adrian Courage to organize um, researchers conference on Bologna, to write academic papers, to write a book as we intend to do after this conference, but this book to be introduced by someone on a general language to ministers of education once they meet. And it happened almost all time since 2011, when the first time was organized this uh, uh, conference of researchers. Maybe our book, and for this reason, we have to uh, ask the support of the participants to this uh, conference, should be presented to leaders across the world with a short introduction, simple introduction, to understand the value of education when we speak about very sensitive, even critical topics like human security. And thank you, Gary, for uh, leading all this uh, uh, process, uh, not just the World Academy of Art and Science, but to be really keen on education uh, and organizing this conference. Thank you all.